Welcome to our, our midweek online worship as we continue our series on Eyes on Jesus. Tonight we consider those who gathered around Jesus with worldly eyes. That will be the theme that we will uh, concentrate on today. I invite you to join me as we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. As we worship today, I invite you to join me as we confess our sins. As we perceive how the people around Jesus were unable to truly see him, let us confess our own failures to respond to his grace and mercy. And I invite you to take a moment to silently reflect upon your life. We confess together. We, we pray, pray that you, you Heavenly, Heavenly Father, will forgive us all our sins, sins for Jesus' sake. Help us fix our eyes on Jesus each day until we follow him to our eternal home, where we shall see you face to face. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside the Lord who acts for those who wait for him. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. A reading from the second chapter of 1st John. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, 
the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, and pride and possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In this reading, Jesus contrasts his kingdom with that of Pilate and the world. A reading from the 18th chapter of John. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. This Lent, we are looking at the events of our Lord's passion through the eyes of some of the people who witnessed it. Today, we find ourselves speaking the words of the chief priests and the soldiers, the groups who called for Jesus' execution and ironically called him king. The passion of our Lord is according to St. Mark, the 15th chapter. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas, instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. I want you more than gold or 
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines worldly in a couple of different ways. It says that worldly can mean having a lot of practical experience and knowledge about life in the world, or it can mean thinking about things in this world, ordinary things versus thinking about things from a spiritual or a religious perspective. And in our passion reading for tonight, we see the use of the term used both ways for Pilate, for the religious leaders, particularly the chief priests, and even the soldiers who scourge and mock Jesus. You know, Pilate didn't rise to a significant level of leadership in the Roman Empire without being worldly, worldly wise. As a governor, he had to convince the emperor that he was of value, that he could bring value to Caesar. But in so doing, Pilate had to look out for number one, not the people. He was a man with worldly passions and ambitions and desires. He was worldly in the sense that he really didn't care about religious matters. As a matter of fact, he tolerated the Jews because in his mind, they were a thorn in his side. In fact, at times he provoked them and at times he persecuted them. So it was quite surprising when he cooperated with the Jewish leaders, the chief priests, during the trial of Jesus. It's true that he thought Jesus was innocent because of his own investigation into the circumstances leading to Jesus' arrest. He also believed Jesus was innocent because his wife had had a dream saying that Jesus was without any malice. Yet in the end, Pilate's worldliness won out. His religious skepticism is on full display when he questioned Jesus and when he asked Jesus, what is truth? And there the truth was, standing right before him, bloodied and beaten, but he was God's truth. Pilate's pragmatism is demonstrated in the fact that he gives in to the vocal Jews who want Barabbas freed, even though Barabbas is a murderer. They want Barabbas freed and want Jesus crucified. And so to pacify the Jews, Pilate gives in to their request because he's afraid that they may lead a significant rebellion for an insignificant ruler in his mind if he goes ahead and deems Jesus innocent. The leader of the Jews, they have worldly eyes. The Sadducees, of which the chief priests were a part, saw Jesus as compromising their power because they had negotiated with the Romans an uneasy peace. The Pharisees, who were merchants and other uh, leaders in the community saw Jesus eroding their influence and disagreeing with their legalistic interpretation of God's word. And therefore, the worldly Jewish leaders stirred up the crowds to ask for Jesus' crucifixion. And of course, the Roman soldiers, they had worldly eyes. They knew kings. And, in Jesus, and, in, and in, as far as Jesus was concerned, he wasn't a king. They had, many of them had seen Caesar. If not in passing, they had served perhaps in, in one of his battalions. They had seen kings from the east if they had gone on foreign excursions 
and they knew the pomp and the circumstance with which those individuals carried themselves. But this Jewish carpenter who was bloodied and beaten standing before them, how could he be a king? What a joke! And so they bow down and praise him in mockery. Oh, king of the Jews, hail king of the Jews. But what's so ironic is Pilate and the soldiers actually get it right. Because Jesus is the Messiah, the promised king. He's the one that was promised to Adam and Eve, to, to Moses, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. He's the fulfillment of all the prophets. Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Rather, he came into this world from heaven to bear witness to the truth. And here is the truth. Jesus was and is a king, but not a worldly one. He is a heavenly king. He is divine king. He is God's son in the flesh. And though the world looks for power and glory and rulers, the true God glories in suffering. He glories in the cross. He displays his power to save in Jesus, who is crucified and risen. Crucify him, say the crowds. Crucify him, says God the Father. Crucify me is what Jesus says as he stands on trial. Jesus had come to do the Father's will, to draw all men to himself and to bear the sins of the masses in his own body and to die for the life of the world. Those beautiful words of John 3, 3.16 are so true. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And God did that to reconcile the world to himself so that our sins might not be counted against us. You might ask yourself, was Jesus death for me? Well, let me ask you a question. Are you in the world? And the answer is yes. And who is Jesus? He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which means the guilt and shame of your sin you need not carry any longer, for your sins have been removed from you. They have been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. The truth of the gospel is that we've been set free from bondage to sin, death, and the power of the devil. And so now we look forward to eternal righteousness. We look forward to eternal life. Look forward to resurrection in God's heavenly kingdom. Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world. And because his kingdom is not of this world and we are part of his kingdom through our baptism and by faith, that means our mind is not a worldly mindset, but our mindset is a heavenly one. Paul writes, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Jesus prayed for us when he was in the garden as he was betrayed that evening. Father, I've given, given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. Satan would have us join in the viewpoint shared by Pilate. What is truth? And this kind of religious skepticism can lead people to despair to the point where they want to leave this world via suicide or whether they want to just immerse themselves in total worldly desires with the thought of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But you and I are of a different mindset because we have hope and life through Christ Jesus. We know the truth about the world. It's gonna pass away. But as Jesus says, Whoever does the will of God abides forever. So my friends, embrace the truth of the cross, the cross by which you have been crucified to the world, the world's been crucified to you. This is God's desire for you. This is God's way for you. 
No matter what status you may have in the world, you have wonderful status in God's sight because you are part of his kingdom. And he has planned for you something that is out of this world, an eternal blessing that this world cannot compare to. Thanks be to God for the hope that we have in Jesus. Amen. The peace that surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We give thanks to God that his eyes are always on us through Christ. And in response to his grace and mercy, we give to him our gifts, our talents, and treasures. And I invite you to consider offering a financial gift to the Lord either online or you can give one by mailing it to the church. Let us pray for the whole church around the world, ourselves, and all people in their various needs. For farmers and ranchers and those who bring food to market, that God would pro provide favorable weather, bountiful harvests, and relief from drought and flood and coronavirus, let us pray to the Lord. Look on them all in your mercy, Heavenly Father. For all who struggle with unemployment or underemployment in these days, with poor living conditions or displacement from home, with personal demons or ill health, let us pray to the Lord. Behold their turmoil, Lord Jesus, and grant them relief and hope. For all in authority over communities and countries, all whose decisions affect the health and climate of our planet, the health of its inhabitants and all who are charged to maintain justice within borders and peace among nations, let us pray to the Lord. Gaze upon your servants, O Lord. Protect and guide them that they may serve you with wisdom, compassion, and courage. For all who serve the Lord as they care for others, medical personnel and health care workers, first responders, counselors, and advisors, friends and neighbors, professionals and volunteers. Let us pray to the Lord. Observe how they use the gifts you have given them, O Holy Spirit, and open doors of opportunity for them so that many may rejoice together. For the church, wherever it gathers around word and sacrament, relying on God's steadfast love and faithfulness and looking forward to the fulfillment of all his gracious promises, let us pray to the Lord. Watch over your church, Lord Jesus. Protect and defend us until that day we see you face to face. Lord, we lift up to you prayers of healing for those who are ill, those battling the coronavirus, and we ask for comfort for those families who mourn the loss of loved ones. We also pray for healing for people we know in this congregation for Marilyn Palumbo as she deals with a foot injury, for Janet, Linda Struckmeyer's cousin, as she recovers from cancer surgery. We pray also a prayer of thanksgiving for the birth of little Ned Andrew Warwick, and we pray that he would continue to grow and thrive as he is home now with his parents after a brief hospitalization. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, for your gracious care for the family of Ed Salo, as they were spared their lives, however, lost their home in the tornado that struck Jonesboro, Arkansas. Be with them and all others who are picking up the pieces after this devastation, and may they continue to look to you. Into your hands, Heavenly Father, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Together we pray. Our, our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace as you serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.